continue with our talk about Amoris Laetitia and we will try to talk a little bit about chapter 8, dealing with irregular situations. I would like to read with you the um, two numbers that I consider very important. The Synod Father stated that although the Church realizes that any breach of the marriage bond is against the will of God, she is also conscious of the frailty of many of her children. Christian marriage as a reflection of the union between Christ and his church is fully realized in the union between a man and a woman who give themselves to each other in a free, faithful and exclusive love, who belong to each other until death and are open to the transmission of life and are consecrated by the sacrament which grants them the grace to become a domestic church and a living of new life for society. Some forms of union radically contradict this ideal, while others realize it in at least a partial and analogous way. So we can see here that the church has changed its approach. On the one hand, it continues to proclaim the goodness of a fully realized union in marriage. The vocation has not changed. It is the indissolubility of marriage. The church affirms that some unions contradict this idea radically. All the elements of the doctrine on marriage are loyal to the traditional teaching of the church. Nothing has changed. But on the other hand, the church doesn't want to condemn all other forms of union, but tries to consider the good elements, the seeds of love and justice that are within them. Instead of looking at these types of unions as completely threatening, we must look at them more as opportunities occasions for pastoral mission. An example might be a couple that is against the principle of marriage, but they are cohabitating while unmarried because they have no money to pay for the wedding. But they are not against, sorry, I made a mistake, they are not against the principle of marriage. They just cannot be married because they don't have money for the marriage. For example, in Peru, this happens a lot um, because weddings are very expensive. To, to get married into a church is very expensive. And you know that we have lots of poor people that live in poverty and they are not able to pay for a wedding. So we have to try to find other solutions because these people that live in cohabitation, uh, they believe in marriage. They want to be married, but they can't marry. So what are the three principles that we could use dealing with irregular situations? The Pope asked us to how to deal with these irregular situations. The first, uh, there are three principles for dealing with irregular situations that we have to try to understand. First, the law of graduality. Second, the conscience. And third, the need for discernment. So, the first principle is the law of graduality. What does it mean? It means that all of us, all of us can improve our relationship with God and become more virtuous gradually. We can never jump into perfection in a single step. We need a path. We need steps. This teaching is in continuity with John Paul II, who affirmed in Familiaris Consortium number no. 9 that a human being fulfills moral good according to their stage of growth. For this reason, Amoris Laetitia states that it is not a graduality of the law, but 
a graduality in the prudential exercise of free acts in subjects who are not in a position to understand, appreciate, or fully practice the objective requirements of the law. So what the Pope is trying to propose is the law of graduality, not the graduality of the law. The law of graduality is that we tend to the ideal, but we know that you, can, you have to reach this ideal by steps, getting there to the ideal. While in the case of the graduality of the law, eh, is think that there are different degrees of forms of perception God's law for different individuals and situations. That's not what the Pope is proposing. Um, for this reason, in the end, with a touch of deep real realism, an invitation to Christian Pope, Pope Francis points out to relativize the historical path we are doing as families, to stop pretending from interpersonal relationships a perfection, a purity of intentions and a coherence that we can only find in the definitive kingdom. I would like to go back to the girl we met, um, the, the example I did, the, word, the girl I met when she was 16 years old and she was pregnant. I supported her and when she had her baby and she's now more stable, I will begin helping her to talk about the value of marriage and maternity and the importance of not having casual encounters. So it's when, in what moment of her path, I will help and teach and share some values. So it is that I have not changed the values for the girl, is that it depends in what situation. I will not do it while she's pregnant awaiting the baby. I will do it afterwards, a little bit afterwards, so she can concentrate just in looking for her baby. So that's the first point. The second one, uh, the second principle that is needed in, this, in dealing with these situations is the subjective conditions or the conditions of conscience. What does it mean? Let's read together number 303. Recognizing the influence of such concrete factors, we can add that individual conscience needs to be better incorporated into the church's practice in certain situ situations which do not objectively embody our understanding of marriage. Naturally, every effort should be made to encourage the development of an enlightened conscience, formed and guided by the responsible and serious discernment of one's pastor and to encourage an ever greater trust in God's grace. Yet, conscience can do more than recognize that a given situation does not correspond objectively to the overall demand of the gospel. It can also recognize with sincerity and honesty what for now is the most generous response. So, Pope Francis considers that the personal story and the conscience of the subject is central for the reception of the doctrine. Without this reception, personal reception, the doctrine is dead. Sometimes in Catholic education, we have imposed norms and doctrines on young people without helping them to assimilate them in a personal way that orientates their freedom in their choices. We need to form consciences and not to substitute it. That is why Pope Francis doesn't want to oblige Catholics with norms and prohibitions, but he wants them to understand the value that hides behind. Pope Francis also makes a self-criticism of how the Church has talked about love and family. For example, sometimes we Catholic defend marriage and family thinking that by talking about our ideas, people will change. Number 37 of Amoris Letizia. We have long thought that simply by stressing doctrinal, bioethical and moral issues without encouraging openness to grace, we were providing sufficient support to families, strengthening the marriage bond and giving meaning to marital life. 
we find it difficult to present marriage more as a dynamic path to personal development and fulfillment that has that as a lifelong burden. We also find it hard to make room for the consciences of the faithful, who very often respond as best they can to the gospel, amid their limitations, and are capable of carrying out their own discernment in complex situations. We have been called to form consciences, not to replace them. In Catholic theology, conscious in the human being is not just a subjective dimension. We are not talking of conscience as a psychological trait of the psyche. Conscience was at the core of the teachings of Vatican II. And Vatican II um, considered that conscience uh, is the sacred place in our heart where God God's presence dwells. So it's not a definition, it's not a psychological definition, it's not just a psychological dimension, it's a spiritual one. Um, it's the real presence of God within each of us. It's like a sacred place in our hearts in which God is present and talks to us and inspire inspires us. Cardinal Newman um, developed a lot the, in his theology uh, the concept of conscience and he said he defined it as a special faculty of the mind and he said it is a specific and integral operation of the human soul. He continued talking and he said conscience is a messenger of God who both in nature and in grace speaks to us behind a veil and teaches us and rules us by his representatives. Conscience, he continues, is the aboriginal vicar of Christ, a prophet in its information, a monarch, a priest in its blessings and anathemas. And even though the eternal priesthood throughout the church should cease to be, in it the sacerdotal principle would remain. And talking about this moral obligation, Newman affirms, toast the Pope by conscience first. So we cannot do anything if our conscience doesn't accept it. We have, all our acts has to be done has to be done in conscience, has to be done with free responsibility and, and and consciousness. We can never go against our conscience. It is better to be an atheist, not to believe in God, than to believe in God just because someone is imposing you that and not done it because you consciously believe in that. So that is why conscience is so important because. Is the is is like a duty of our um, to be authentic with our own um, person. It is true also that we can err, that we can have that we can make mistakes with our conscience. But we also need faith because because of our baptism, we participate in the prophetic mission of Christ. So as we participate in this prophetic mission and we have the faith, we have a gift, the gift of the sensus fide fidelis. What is the sensus fide fidelis? It is like a characteristic of the faith. It's the fact that we know that we unfailingly adhere to the faith, that we are able to penetrate into the faith with right judgment and apply it more fully in daily life. So, sensus fideli, fidei fidelis, is like a, a sort of a spiritual instinct that enables believers to judge spontaneously whether a particular teaching or practice is or is not in conformity with the gospel and with apostolic faith. 
So it's very important to form the conscious, to educate a conscious, and to live by conscious. And the third um, principle that Pope considers important for these irregular situations is the need of discernment. What is discernment? It has been quoted several times in the encyclical, 35 times, clearly echoed Ignatius of Loyola that com and confirmed by two precise quotes from St. Thomas Aquinas. Let's read number 312. If we take into account the innumerable vari variety of concrete situations, it is understandable that we should not expect from the Synod or this exhortation a new general canonical norm, applicable in all cases. Priests have the task of accompanying people concerned on the path of discernment according to the Church's teachings and the Bishop's guidelines. This is an accompanying and discerning itinerary that directs these faithful to the awareness of their situation before God. The dialogue with the priest, internally, contributes to the formation of a correct judgment on what is hindering the possibility of a fuller, fuller participation in the life of the Church and the step that can help and grow it. This discernment can never ignore the requirements of truth and charity of the gospel proposed by the church. This task is, of discernment is also entrusted to lay people who are devoted to the Lord. And then here I will just finish with a, perhaps the question that many of us uh, has, have. This, is the Pope allowing communion for remarried divorcees? No, he is not allowing to all uh, remarried divorcees to accept and receive communion. At the same time, he's not saying no one, uh, uh, no one can receive communion if it is a mar if he if she or he is a remarried divorcee. What he's saying is we have to evaluate each case. The important thing is that for access to communion, we cannot take communion if we are in a mortal sin. So, has the doctrine changed? No. Always the doctrine has said that we can only receive the communion if we are not in immortal sin. And what are the characteristics for a mortal sin? Freedom, conscience, and grave matter. So, the three elements are necessary to be in mortal sin. Perhaps it can happen that perhaps you have the grave matter, the situation in which you were was married and then you get remarried after a divorce. But perhaps you lacked you lack of freedom or you lack of conscious of consciousness. So that is why the discernment before God, with a priest, with uh, the spiritual director, with a lay, uh, a responsible lay, is possible to do it to understand which is our situation before God. Sometimes a person knowing the norm is unable to live it. He or she cannot take another option without generating another sin. For example, a case of a remarried woman that she recognized that she, she did wrong, that she, she's really in repentance, but she cannot separate, she cannot um, leave his second husband because he has a new, new kid with him and, and she will commit another sin if she does that. So that's why in that situation, for example, when you will generate an, a worse sin is better to stay in the situation where you were, because you cannot do in another way. So, does the Pope have the authority to change the discipline? Yes, he has. Other Popes have changed the discipline about communion. The Council of Trent excommunicated those who lived in adultery, and they were not allowed to enter to the Church. 
And this communication changed, for example, in familiaris consortium and in canon law. So the only change, the only thing that, we, that it has changed is that the Pope is saying that in some situations, uh, some remarried divorcees are not in mortal sin and they would be able with a discernment and clarity before God that they are not in mortal sin because some of the elements for the mortal sin is lacking. The other day I read a Maori proverb that for me synthesized the spirit of Pope Francis writing this letter. E aha te mea nui o te ao. What is the most important thing in the world? Etangata, etangata, etangata. It is the people, it is the people, it is the people. Thank you very much.